Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 113. The film is made in the editing room. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether it be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And at, on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in a course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it keeps it very, very fresh and you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects. And you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Video Blocks is offering the tribe a yearly subscription for 99 bucks. That's 50 bucks off the usual price tag just for you guys, just for the tribe. That's less than 10 bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to videoblocks.com slash hustle. That's videoblocks, V-I-D-E-O blocks.com forward slash hustle for this exclusive offer. And don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from Audible. So guys, today's episode is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Post-production, where I've been making my bones for the last 20 odd years working on uh god thousands of different projects over the course of my career and uh probably over 50 or 60 features uh easily over 100 150 um indie film projects either shorts and or features documentaries and so on so i've i've got a lot of experience working in the uh in the post production field and i wanted to come up with a podcast that kind of talked about the steps of post production because there's a lot of confusion a lot of people don't understand the basic understanding of what post-production, not workflow, but just the steps that are taken in post-production. Uh, and a couple of tips I'm going to throw at you during this uh, this list, these 13 steps, is uh, going to help you with workflow, which is so, so massive. And there's another episode I did on post-production workflow called Post-Production Workflow, Understand It or Die, which is uh, episode 14. Uh, and you can download that one at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 014. And uh, that's a really good episode, a very, very popular episode as well. So let's get into it, guys. So step one, selecting the editing software that you're going to be using to edit your movie. A lot of people just, you know, grab whatever they have access to and not think about things going down the line. So uh, a lot of people are like, well, I have access to an Avid or I have access to a Premiere or I have access to Final Cut 7 or Final Cut X. Uh, or God forbid, Sony Vegas. <laughs> I'm sorry if anyone's editing out there in Sony Vegas land. Uh, stop. <laughs> I'm joking, joking, but no, really stop. It's it's hurting yourself and people around you. But anyway, um, so be, making that choice is very, very integral because depending on the format you're shooting on, so if you've shot on Alexa, you shot on a DSLR, uh, you shot on a red, and so on. There's different workflows that you're going to have to understand. So picking that software is going to be very crucial uh, to you. And I know a lot of times uh, creative editors, especially older creative editors uh, or more established creative editors will work with Avid, which is great. Avid is the you know industry-leading piece of software, but sometimes Avid does not work really well with anything other than edits going down the line, working with red or working with um, specifically red I'm in the middle of a project right now. We're having issues reconnecting certain things and, you know, just things get wonky. I'm not sure as much of that might be the problem with Red or might be with Avid 
but I know that Premiere is much more stable in that world. I know Final Cut is, and I know DaVinci Resolve handles it wonderfully, and I'm a big, uh, big, big fan of editing in DaVinci, as everybody who listens to this podcast know I edited, DaVin- I edited uh, This Is Meg completely 100% in DaVinci. But anyway, picking that is very, very important, so understand that you will have to uh, pick something that's going to Un, that's going to work with your workflow going down the line, whatever that workflow might be. But make sure you're very cautious about what you're editing on and, and it's going to be able to achieve what you need. Second is, collect, uh, is selecting a, an editor, someone who understands story, understands what they're going to be doing. And then that will also determine uh, what, so- what software you're going to be using because the editor, generally speaks, generally speaking, uses a software that they're most comfortable with. But uh, choosing that editor is such an important person, uh, such an important job in the post production process, because uh, you could find editors that are uh, creative editors only, who are just going to be doing the creative, which is generally speaking what most people do. Uh, occasionally, you will find a creative editor who happens to understand the technical aspects of things, which are really, really beneficial if you can find someone like that. But as again, generally speaking, you're going to mostly find uh, just creative editors who are going to be able to do creatively what you need to have happen with your movie. So picking that person is very, very, very important. Now, the next part of the pro- the post-production process would be selecting a sound editor, someone who's going to be able to, well, it's not as much even a sound editor as a sound house. Someone, either a house, uh, a post-production company, an audio post-production company, or a person who's going to be able to do all the aspects of what is needed in audio post-production. Now, I've worked with guys who do uh, you know everything in their house, and they're a one-man band, and they can literally do everything. I've fa- I have found that guys that do everything like that in their house, they're really not capable of giving you everything that you are you need unless they have a Foley stage and a full ADR suite and all this kind of stuff. Is it possible? Yes. But generally speaking, I would go with a post-production house of some sort, and there's many out there who will work at a low-budget world uh, that I, I know of the guys who work over at Monkey Land Audio here in uh, Burbank. Uh, they they definitely work with low budgets and work with independent filmmakers and are indie friendly. Uh, again, I'm not I'm not doing this as a as a marketing campaign for them, but there's just there's many other ones uh, in LA uh, that do that as well. But uh, but definitely finding a sound editor, someone uh, or a sound post production house that's going to be able to get you all the sound. Uh, elements that you're going to need and deliverables you're going to need to make your movie move forward. The next step is uh, ADR. So I'm going to explain to you what ADR is, automatic dialogue replacement, which basically means that if you record something on the day, on location, and there happens to be a plane flying by, uh, that that's not going to be usable in the final mix of your movie. So you're going to need someone to go in, you're going to need the actors to come into, into an ADR session, which they'll put up the picture up on a screen, And then at that point, the actor will mouth the same lines that he or she had on the day and replace that audio cleanly. Now, I'm not a huge fan of ADR. I actually hate ADR because I feel that it never matches exactly the way the energy was of the day or the vibrance of the performance of the day. So I really like on Meg, we I think had two lines of ADR and it was mostly grunts and like uh, 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 kind of stuff. It was not like full blown dialogue. So I kind of ran with it, and of course, a movie like Meg made sense to do something like that because it was very kind of raw um, and naturalistic. But it is something that you will have to do. I have had to do ADR in other um, other movies of mine, other projects of mine. So definitely keep that in mind that you will need to do that. Uh, another thing you're going to need to is finding a place that does Foley. Foley is basically somebody going out and making all the sounds for every little movement that happens in the movie. So obviously when you're recording someone running down the street and there's or, or, or two people, let's say two people walking down the street and they're talking, well, your focus on the day is to record the dialogue that the people, the actors uh, talking. You're not focused on recording the footsteps or the wind blowing or the tree that they kind of ran, the bush they ran into or anything like that. That's what Foley is for. And you have to find a, a studio that has a full Foley stage. In that Foley stage, they have – they're so awesome, these places. It's like basically a junkyard of a million different sounds, things that can make sounds. They have floors where if you lift up one um, one, one lip part of the floor, you got sand, gravel, water, uh, wet, dry. It's 
for sand. It, it's awesome. It's really, really awesome. But you need a studio that can handle that. That's why I'm saying a lot of times these one-man bands can't do that. Now, could you replace those sounds instead of Foley with canned sound effects, like canned people walking? When I say canned, it means that someone else has recorded generic footsteps somewhere, and then the um, the sound mixer, uh, sound designer, can actually just replace your footsteps with those canned footsteps. Yes, of course you can, um, but it's never 100%. Sometimes it worked wonderfully, and again, I'll use Meg as an example. We used a lot of sound effects in Megs that were canned because they're perfectly fine. You don't need to do a, a brand new Foley session for those. But there were other things that were very specific, like you know when Meg is getting up out of bed and her her she, her sheets are, are kind of rubbing up against each other to kind of give give a little bit of a sound. It's very difficult to find that in a sound design scenario. I mean, in, in a uh, in a canned in scenario, you're going to have to find. Uh, you know, had a Foley artist to kind of match that exactly for it to sound right. So it's definitely something you have to keep an eye on, but that is something else you will need. And if for deliverables, you will need a full M&E track. Uh, this is a little bonus sidetrack, but for deliverables. But an M&E track means music and effects. So when you try to sell this movie or your movie overseas, you will have um, only music and effects track, and then they can replace their dialogue with foreign actors replacing the dialogue of your actors. Uh, but without that m and &E track, they can't do that. So then you would not be able to sell your movie to other territories. So having a full, fully laid out m and &E track, and if you go even fully more of that, you can actually spread that, set, uh, separate the music and the effects, and then every single sound effect has to be created in a Foley session and or sound design session. And uh, that's much, much more expensive and much more for higher-end movies. But that's something else that you'd have to keep an eye on um, for your project. So... Speaking of music, that is our next step, is music. Finding a composer to be able to bring music to life in your movie. Now, it could be with uh, pre-recorded pre, uh, music, uh, existing music, or you hire an actual composer to compose original music for your movie, something that you will definitely need uh, in about 99.9% .9 of all movies will have some sort of music in it. So definitely hiring some uh, hiring music or composer is extremely important. Now, my experience is working with music and doing all the movies I've done is generally speaking, you're always waiting for music at the end of the, you know, the edits done, the colors done, the, um, the mix is ready, the sound house is waiting for music to do the final mix. So uh, just stay on top of your composer to make sure those deadlines are hit. Uh, when working with a composer. And again, I'm being very general here, guys. Not all composers take time. But a lot of times you're also rushing the composer to create music based on timelines too, and they're doing the best job they can. But hiring that composer will bring life to your movie or putting in uh, pre-recorded music or, or needle drop music, as they say, which is stock music that you can easily get the rights to. Uh, you could do that as well. The next step is the mix. Now, the mix is extremely important uh, when mixing the audio, all the audio elements together. So a lot of times, uh, I've had this happen, um, the, the, sound, uh, the sound guys have created um, sound effects for certain, let's say, you know, moments that need to be like accented. So, you know, I'll use the example of, uh, you know, a horror movie when someone, you know, goes in and slices somebody like, you know, the, the, the axe murderer is coming in to slice something. The sound effect might be really big. Um, to just like really scare the hell out of the audience. Well, the composer might have had the same thought and created a big hit of music at that same moment. Well, those two sounds are going to fight each other. So then that's where we have to kind of work around like, okay, what do we want in the mix? And that's why it's so important. The mix is so, so important because certain things you want to bring down lower, certain things you want to bring up higher, depending on what kind of emotional um, reaction you're trying to get from the audience. Uh, Hitchcock was... Uh, the master of this. He literally played his audience like a fiddle uh, because he was able to just bring things in and out. And he was able to do that with images as well. But as far as the mix is concerned, he would just pop things up just right at the right moment and bring them back down. And that is why the mix is, is such an important part of it. So being in the room uh, in a properly uh, constructed room where you can hear a 5-1 mix. 5-1 is a surround sound mix. Now they have 7-1, they have Atmos multiple different kinds of mixes uh, that you can create. And I was uh, the next the next step is something I've already kind of spoken about, which is music and effects. Creating that M&E track. Very, very important 
uh, going forward because you will not be able to sell your movie internationally unless you have a full m and &E track laid out. Another step that you're going to be dealing with is titles. The, uh, the, the basic titles at the beginning, basic critics at the end, rolling credits, and so on. I have been involved with so many movies that I have yet to once, not one time in 70-odd movies that I've finished, that the end credits or any of the credits were done in the first pass. They're always adding something. Something's always misspelled. Someone's changing their credit like, oh, I, I need to have this guy up above this other guy or this girl above this other girl because of ego or because of contractual issues and so on and so forth. But you will need to create these titles. So whoever's going to be doing your online, uh, being your online editor, you will have to find, uh, see if he'll be able to create those, he or she will be able to create those uh, opening credits, which either could do basic opening credits or you can do like, you know, seven style, uh, David Fincher seven style um, credits, which are much more elaborate and a production in themselves. And then basic rolling credits. So that's a conversation you have to have with your online editor. Now, as opposed to a creative editor, and I'll talk about this really briefly, creative editors, they're literally just to be creative. The online editor is the person who's going to put everything together. That's going to put in the final edit. That's going to put in the color graded images. That's going to put the final mix, put in your titles, and get everything ready for your deliverables. Online editor is extremely, extremely important and sometimes very overlooked by producers they're like, oh, my editor could just put it all together. And I cannot tell you how many times I've had movies come into my into my office that, that just happened. Oh, I thought my editor was going to be able to do it. And the editor had no idea, creative editor, had no idea technically what needed to be done. Or they're moving on to another project and they're being creative and they're not worried about deliverables and titles and any of that crap. So very, very specific. you got to find a good online editor. And on another side note, guys, please, for God's sakes, talk to a post-production supervisor. I mean, seriously, it's so upsetting. You could either talk to a post-production supervisor. If you have the money, hire a post-production supervisor. If not, consult with one so they can talk to you about workflow and making sure things are done right. If not, you, you might get stuck and lost in the pit that is post-production uh, unless you understand the roadmap that you need to take to get out of the forest. Sometimes I've seen people wander in that forest for, for months, if not years, trying to get their movies finished. Uh, but just a, a little conversation a little consulting with a post-production supervisor could save you thousands upon thousands and months upon months of time. So please keep that in mind. Another part of the, uh, the, the process is obviously color grading. So without a colorist color grading your movie, it's going to look like crap. And if you want to create high uh, production value in your movie, you've got to get it color graded. Even if you want a simple basic color, like, oh, I don't really need a color graded. I'm just going to do it myself in my Avid. Or I'm going to do it myself in Premiere or Final Cut. Just something basic. I don't need anything really crazy. I don't want this to look like a Michael Bay movie. Well, even the basic stuff is hard to do, and you have to make sure everything evens out, scene to scene, um, and thematically everything works the same way. You know, colorist is uh, very well needed, and if you don't use a colorist nowadays, uh, you're not going to sell your movie. Uh, it's very difficult to do so without having some basic color. And I'm not talking about crazy stuff. I'm just talking about just getting everything to look even and nice and clean. Uh, or you can create very, very cool looks as well. So next on the list is the DCP, the Digital Cinema Package, as part of your deliverables. So now you've created your movie. Your movie is edited. It's colored. has a final mix to it. has your titles to it. Everything's ready to go. Now you create a DCP. Now, a lot of people say you got to create a DCP right away. I disagree. DCP is basically a digital cinema package. It's only for theatrical uh, exhibition. So if you're going to go to a big festival, uh, then you might need a DCP, depending if it's like a Sundance or Tribeca or any of the big festivals. They only exclusively will project in the DCP format. So you have to create one eventually, but don't spend the money until you need it. All right, please do not spend the money until you need it. Um, another part of the uh, deliverables things a lot of people don't really pay a lot of attention to is a dialogue script. So a dialogue script is basically a script that just lays out all the dialogue of your movie. So that way you can send that dialogue script in so people in foreign countries can create a subtitles or things like that that they might need to sell your movie. So you need to create a dialogue script as well. Um, now, you also, 
Another step, guys, a lot of people forget about is the campaign image of for your film. Now, a campaign image is basically a still, and you're going to need multiple stills. A lot of distributors are going to ask for 60, 70 stills. And this is something that a lot of people forget. I even forgot about it in Meg. I don't have a tremendous amount of behind-the-scenes stills. And when I say stills, I'm not talking about those cool behind-the-scenes stills of you and, and the camera and the crew shooting the scene. Those are great, and those are needed as well. I'm talking about the promo stills, the campaign image, meaning that when a cameraman is literally or a, some, a photographer standing right next to the cameraman taking an image, a shot of the scene as it's being recorded, and those are the scenes that they go out and help promote your movie, something you have to have uh, if you expect to sell um, to a distributor or get those out there, and it's helpful regardless. Now, you'll say, I know a lot of people are like, well, I'm shooting in 5 or 6K, I could just pull it off the red, or I could just pull it off the raw image. I'm like, you, you easily could do that as well, especially if you start shooting at the higher resolutions. That's a lot easier to do nowadays. But uh, for the rest of us are not shooting at that super, super high resolution, uh, it's helpful to have something uh, more traditional by just shooting it with a uh, high-end iPhone, um, or shooting it with a professional, having a professional photographer shooting stills for you on set. Uh, and the second to last thing is so important. I can't even express to you how important this is. The trailer. The trailer is so, so, so important to your post-production process, to the process of selling your movie. Have I mentioned how important the trailer is? <laughs> The reason why I laugh is because a lot of people forget about the trailer. They're like, oh, I'm just going to kind of just throw something together. You have to understand that the trailer is going to be seen by more people. At least 50, 100 times more people will watch that trailer than will watch your movie. And it is going to be, that is the biggest calling card for your movie is not the poster, not anything. It's the trailer. In today's social media world that everything is video, 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 that trailer you know, I released Meg, and within the first couple days, we we got we're downloaded almost twenty thousand times, or a little bit over twenty thousand times throughout all of our platforms, which is pretty amazing for such a small little movie with you know no major backing or major studio behind it. So it's just a small little film, and it's like, oh, that's really really cool that I was able to do that. But that trailer is being seen and gaining the interest. So keep it very, take it very seriously about shooting or about uh, editing a trailer. Hire a professional editor trailer, a, tra a trailer editor who understands how to sell movies. If you have the money, hire a trailer producer and uh, have them actually write a script for the trailer. Super, super, super important, guys. Um, and then the very last thing that's not on the list, but I thought I'd throw it in there, is the website. Now, I know this is not part of your post-production process, but it is the process of selling your movie. So at the end of it, if you don't have a website, a real website for your movie, you're screwed. <laughs> you need a website. You need a hub for everything to everybody to come to. A website to help sell your product, to sell your movie, to tell people where screenings are, to show your trailer, to show behind-the-scenes footage, to connect to your Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest and all the other uh, platforms as well. You need a hub. So creating a very cool website is very, very imperative. Uh, especially in today's world. Now, you can go to uh, to many different places to create a website. You can create your own website uh, by using different plugins on WordPress, multiple things like that. Uh, I have a whole course, or I have a whole, not course, but I have a whole uh, article written about how to create a, a, a kick-ass website, and I will leave that in the in the in link in the show notes, which, of course, the show notes will be at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 113. And I hope that's it, guys. That's basically all the steps. I, I went past 13 steps. I added a few other ones in there uh, as well. But I, I wanted to kind of give everybody a brief under a, a brief overview of the post-production process. A lot of people, uh, and it's really quick, guys. It's, I can go into details about every aspect of what I talked about today. But it was just a very you know broad overview of the basic post-production process. And you might have known a lot of it. You might have just found one or two that were like, hey, I didn't know that. I, I need to do that. I'm going to do a whole uh, other thing about deliverables coming up in the months, uh, weeks and months ahead. And a bunch of other stuff that I'm going to be probably tossing into the syndicate, doing uh, some mini courses on post-production workflow, uh, post-production uh, deliverables, and so on in the syndicate, uh, which, of course, you can check out at IndieFilmSyndicate.com. Now, guys, I know it's the holiday season. 
and we are now officially in the holiday season. And uh, I know you guys, uh, if you're listening to the show, uh, hopefully you're fans of the show and you really love what we do uh, at Indie Film Hustle. And I wanted to give, just kind of, if you guys want to help us out and you can't afford to buy any of our courses or join the syndicate or anything like that, there's a really easy way for you guys to support Indie Film Hustle. Super, super easy way. And all you got to do is go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Amazon. So if you guys are going to buy anything in the holiday season on Amazon or anything else like that, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Amazon and we get a small commission off anything you buy. And you guys get charged nothing for it, by the way. Nothing. It's just a way for you to help support the show. So I really, really would help. I really would be just completely grateful that if you guys are buying anything any time in the year, but of course now because of the holidays uh, and Black Friday and all that kind of good stuff, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Amazon, bookmark it, and anytime you're going to buy anything, buy it through that link, and it helps support us. So anything as little as a bar of soap or as big as a camera package, it really would help us out dramatically. So IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Amazon. I really, really greatly appreciate it. And, of course, head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave us a good review on iTunes. You have no idea how much that helps us to get the word out on what we're trying to do here at the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. Guys, thank you again so, so, so much. I got some really cool guests coming up in the coming weeks. So stay definitely stay tuned. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 